Welcome to our ongoing series of videos from Chapter 5 on Axial Members. This is from Chapter 5, Section 2, and this is our first video, which we're labeling Video A, which addresses the issue of modes of failure of columns. Um, as in the case of tension members, columns can and are limited by yielding of the material. Uh, in the case of tension members, it would be the uh, plastic flow or uh, shattering in tension of the members. In the case of columns, it'll be plastic flow under compressive stress or shattering in the case of brittle materials, which we commonly see in things such as concrete. Uh, in addition, there's another mode of failure which we call elastic instability or buckling, um, wherein uh, the structure is not sufficiently stable and it begins to sh change shape radically before the yield stress of the material is reached, which is why we call it elastic instability, because it occurs while the material is still in its elastic mode. Um, we call this buckling for shorthand and again I emphasize there are two words that will cause some confusion. One is buckling, the other is bending. Buckling occurs in members that are under axial compression. It involves the material moving laterally to get out from under the load. Um, bending is a phenomenon that occurs where the loading is perpendicular to the axis of the member such as in a beam. Um, there are two key kinds of elastic instability. There's the overall buckling of the column, and then if the column has thin walls or material that's less stabilized than other parts, we can also get a phenomenon called local buckling. So in this diagram we see two columns, a little short fat column and a tall slender column. Um, and both of these are constrained. They don't move at the base uh, and all it takes is friction to keep that from happening. And in this case we're presuming some sort of device is constraining them at the top but not in a way that keeps rotation from occurring. So in other words this member can tilt as elastic instability sets in at both the bottom and the top. So we would liken this to a pin joint top and bottom and we call this a pinned pinned column and of course pin pinned column will just flop over if there's not something to constrain it or restrain it at the top and so we've kind of shown in a conceptual way some sort of device which comes up and restrains the columns at the top for both this column with fat proportions and the column with slender proportions. Um, an example of a, a slender pin pin column would be the interior columns of uh, a big box store such as a Lowe's or a Walmart or whatever where there are shear walls all around that constrain the building laterally and then there's a diaphragm roof which is attached to those shear walls so the diaphragm roof can't move around and then the column supports the diaphragm roof so the diaphragm roof in essence uh, restrains the column against lateral movement it's a classic kind of symbiotic relationship that we like to cultivate in structures where the column supports the roof against gravity loads and then the roof returns the favor by stabilizing the top of the column. So the two things are mutually bracing in some sense. So we would tend to have a tall slender column in the case of a big box. In the case of uh, the interior of the World Trade Center down near the base, the forces are so enormous that the cross section of the column might be almost solid steel, three feet by three feet. Uh, on the other hand, um, the column is constrained at each floor against lateral movement so we have a column that's about 15 feet tall and 3 feet 
uh, wide in its horizontal dimension, which would uh, almost always qualify as a short, fat column. So that column would tend to fail by yielding of the material, and the tall slender column in the big box building would tend to fail by uh, buckling. So this is a diagram of the World Trade Center. Uh, there's this rigid frame tube all the way around, which uh, provides the lateral stabilization. There are diaphragm floors, and all of these columns in the middle are basically constrained or restrained against lateral movement where they connect to the floors. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between short fat behavior and long slender behavior. Uh, this is an experiment we did years ago where here we have a bunch of weights that are loaded on top of a platform that can slide up and down. The platform is constrained by these steel rods which go through bearings. Uh, and down below we have a column which is a, an acrylic tube. So in this case it's clear acrylic. Here's a short piece of tube. Here's a longer piece of the same material. You'll notice in this case we have a huge amount of weight uh, piled onto this. And this column, uh, actually this was the last photograph we could get because as soon as we added another weight this column basically shattered explosively and plexiglass shards went flying everywhere. Uh, in the case of this longer slender column, uh, under a much lower load, this is far less weight than that. In fact, these weights right here are the same as those. So this little bundle of weights right here represents that. Um, under this very modest load, you'll notice that the column has begun uh, abruptly to move to the side. So the column was straight and then all of a sudden we added the last weight and it buckled to the side. And it would have collapsed down and shattered except for the fact that we had some um, hose clamps on each of these four vertical rods and those hose clamps stopped this weight table before the column could fail. And we know that we were in elastic instability mode partly because when we took all the weights off of it, the column bounced back and became straight again, which means the material did not yield. And we were able to repeat the experiment uh, many times without actually damaging the column. Whereas in the case of the short fat column, it basically shattered and we'd have to have a new sample every time we did the experiment. The key thing is the cross-sectional material here is the same as the cross-section of the material there. The difference is that one of these columns is much longer than the other and the long slender column is vulnerable to buckling and extremely limited by buckling. As you can see, between the comparison of the weight that was able to be held uh, when, the, when the material yielding was the limiting issue versus this much more modest amount of material which uh, produced the uh, buckling failure. Now in that case we were comparing two columns that had exactly the same cross-section, cross-sectional shape, the same amount of material, the same quality of material, and the only difference was length. Sometimes we don't control the length. I mean we often don't. Uh, we have some kind of design criteria that tell us how tall the column has to be. And our task becomes to design the cross-section of the column so it works. So one of the things we can do is we can say we want to modify the breadth of the column by changing its shape. So here we have an experiment we did with a styrene plastic. Every one of these columns started with a sheet of material 36 inches long by a sixteenth of an inch thick by three inches wide. Every single column here has that same quality of material, that same amount of material, it's just reconfigured. So here we have an angle with no end piece. Here we have an angle with uh, a flat end piece, a beveled end piece, and a pointed end piece. And then we take that same amount of material, we cut it into four three-quarter inch wide strips and make a square tube. Or we cut it into three one-inch strips and make it into a triangle. Or we cut it into seven strips, each about seven sixteenths of an inch wide to make a square rod. Uh, 
So here's the square rod. You'll notice it held about 15 pounds before we uh, observed this buckling behavior. So it was straight when we got to 14 pounds and when we added the 15 pounds, it basically uh, buckled to the side. And that 15 pounds, by the way, accounts for the weight of this platform plus the metal plates here. But that tells us a solid rod doesn't have much breadth. It tends to be quite skinny and to not hold much weight. Now, if we take the same three inch wide strip of material and we cut it into strips that are one inch wide, then the overall dimension becomes roughly one and one sixteenth inch. We glue all that together into the form of a triangle and it was able to hold 95 pounds. So you see we're getting a lot more weight here. So there's a huge difference between the solid rod holding 15 pounds and this triangular tube holding 95. When we went to a square tube, it held 115 pounds. If we could have gotten a round tube that had the same wall thickness and the same amount of material, it would have failed at about 120 pounds. Not dramatically better than the square tube, but somewhat better. On the other hand, going to a triangular tube was the biggest step forward, and then going to the square tube produced additional benefits, but not so dramatic. And again, going to a round tube would again be uh, even less dramatic. So, if we perform experiments and we study what the failure force is, which we're going to call p-critical, uh, consistent with what's in most of the literature, although we could also call this p-failure. They mean the same thing. When we summarize all that, it follows the following equation. The failure force is pi squared times E, which is the material stiffness, times the area, which is the cross-sectional area, divided by L over R, where L is the length of the column and R is a, a quantity called the breadth or the radius of gyration, which is the effective average distance of the material away from the neutral axis about which the buckling might be occurring. The key thing is to note that in this equation, yield stress occurs nowhere. The only material property that occurs here is material stiffness. And this is absolutely crucial that we understand that this is a stiffness phenomenon. If we can make the cross section stiffer, then the column will hold more. If we can make the material stiffer by choosing a different material, then the column will hold more. But the yield stress never enters because the failure occurs before we get to the yield stress. L over R, by the way, is called the slenderness ratio. It's the length over the breadth, and in this case it occurs squared in the denominator. So if we can cut the slenderness ratio in half, then when we square that, we get something that's only a quarter as much, and then when we divide that in, we get four times the critical strength. So we'd really like to increase the breadth. If we can double the breadth, we can increase the strength by a factor of four. Now, we'd like to talk about open sections versus closed sections. Um, clearly, closed sections as columns are the ideal shape because no matter what neutral axis you draw, uh, the material is configured in a way to be strong relative to that neutral axis. So, for example, this tube is just as resistive to buckling about this neutral axis as it is to that one. On the other hand, this H section is clearly stronger about this axis because this flange material is moved further away than it is around this axis where a lot of the material is right near the neutral axis. Uh, in fact, most of the material is near the neutral axis and only these tips out here are a substantial distance away. So this column might be twice as strong relative to buckling about this axis but that doesn't help because in the end it's going to buckle about that axis. So the question is, why would we ever want to use open sections in compression? And the answers are, are complex, but one is they're cheaper to make. 
Uh, two, they sometimes come in higher stress capacities. And if it turns out that the loads are very high, so that the cross section becomes inherently fat anyway, then the wide flange or the open sections may be perfectly satisfactory. And finally, they're much easier to make connections to. If you bolt through a column like this, the bolt will tend to crush the column. So the connections for hollow sections or closed sections uh, tend to be uh, more difficult to achieve. So for example, here we have a trust column cantilevering up out of the ground and all these corners are made out of angles. And in this case, uh, economy of means and connections was crucial. Um, all of these angles can be cut by shears. Uh, the holes can be punched. And so there's no sawing and there's no drilling and the assembly is amazingly easy. And furthermore, this bracing pattern is such that the bracing distance between points is small enough that um, even though this angle is an open section and not the ideal section for resisting buckling, uh, it's still going to work fine uh, because the, the length, the unbraced length between that point and that point is small. Um, this is a really ugly, ragged, utilitarian application. It's possible to do something like this that's got smoother connector connections and is welded nicely together and then ground smooth. Um, but basically, they both are using uh, angles uh, as a cheap and quick way to get the job done. Um, here's another example. Here we have a compression member across the top of this truss. Uh, it's a double angle back to back. Uh, it's really easy to make the welded connections. Here we have a vertical member that goes up between the two uh, and it gets welded to join them together. And then on the outside, we have double angles welded to the outsides of the legs. So it's hard to imagine anything which has easier connections to make. There's no bolting, uh, there's no drilling, um, and all the surfaces tend to fit smoothly together for purposes of supporting the welding operation. Okay, so all that tells us is that angles are pretty interesting, even though they may not be ideal. So we want to, they may not be ideal from a point of view of resisting buckling, but they have lots of other appealing features. So we're going to look at angles as part of the study. So we took the, uh, the beveled uh, angle and we discovered that it failed at about 40 pounds. And when 40 pounds was reached, this is the behavior we get. It's a, a half of a sine wave. Uh, again, the buckling is occurring in this direction. What's keeping this column from collapsing and being mangled are hose clamps underneath that have stopped this platform before we've gone to the point of damaging this column. Again, the column is failing by elastic instability. When the load gets re removed, the column pops back up in a normal building the building would collapse and the column would go through plastic failure at some point and it would lie on the ground mangled and we wouldn't be quite sure what initiated it. But in this case, because we've stopped this platform, we saw the abrupt change in shape. We know it was going to collapse. We know that was, it was not going to be able to stop the load, but we, we uh, intervened with these stops on the vertical rods which kept this platform from moving down any further. And we were able to salvage the column. And in the meantime, we're able to observe its shape and understand that it's frozen here because of those hose clamps, but it is in the process of failing. Now, when we take ones with a square end, we kind of expect that the uh, capacity is going to go up. Uh, it turns out it goes up, but not nearly as much as we thought it would. Um, in essence, when we uh, square off the end, we expect it to be four times stronger because we expect the effective length to be half as much. In other words, we expect to see a buckling shape like this where half the sine wave is actually 
half of the length. Whereas in the case of the pin-pin column, half of a sine wave was the actual length. So we expect the length of this column, the effective length, to be cut in half. Therefore, we expect the column to become four times as strong. And in some experiments, we really observe this effect. Like, for example, when we compare this column to one that is unconstrained, this column is almost exactly four times as strong as that. In the case of these angle columns, though, we didn't observe that factor of four. Um, we would have expected that if the unrestrained column failed at 40 pounds, we get four times that as its strength or 160. However, when we started to load it up, when we got close to 60 pounds, not 160, but 60 pounds, we began to observe this strange behavior where the material started to twist. Now what we're observing here is something called local buckling. Um, the outer legs of these angles are not very well stabilized and they are beginning to move out from under the load. Um, ironically, they're still helping though because they're helping restrain the material close to the intersection and help keep it under the load. If we look down towards the end, what's happened is the material near the outer part of the leg has moved this way. The material on the other leg has gone in a sort of pinwheel fashion with it. But if you look straight down the edge, the back edge of this column, it's still remarkably straight. So what has happened is, and by the way, we have not reached the point where those hose clamps are stopping the downward movement of the platform. We are in a strange intermediate frozen zone where the outer legs of this column have failed. They have shifted the load to the material near the corner. And the material near the corner is still stabilized enough that it is able to take that additional load. Now, most of the time in nature, when one part of a structure fails and transfers the load to some other part, it's very commonly the case that that sudden transfer of load uh, cannot be handled by the portion of the structure that's still functional. So you get what we call a progressive failure. But in the case of this column, these outer edges failed. They have buckled. They have transferred their load to the core material near the corner, and the core material is continuing to support that load, which is allowing us to see this mode of failure uh, sort of frozen for an instant uh, to allow us to observe it and understand it. This is an example of local buckling. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as a non-compact section because the material has been billowed up sufficiently that parts of the cross section are giving up early. If we continue to load it, we got to 60 pounds and this failure occurred and it's, a kind of, it's not your classic uh, uh, beautiful sinuous sine curve. It's a sort of mangled uh, mess that has to do with this uh, material deforming in this very uncomfortable way. Again, this was initiated by a local buckling. Okay, so we've done a number of experiments on things like round tubes and cruciform shapes, and uh, we see this same sort of failure mode in the cruciform columns where uh, the outer edges are giving up, but the, but the interior core where the material is connected together, the planes of material or the sheets of material are stabilizing each other near that core and they're continuing to support the load. The one thing that you will tend to see is that because the things are glued really well at the joint, if this material buckles by going that way, that material will tend to pinwheel with it. In other words, they'll tend to buckle in the same direction rather than go against each other because there's no reason why they would want to go against each other if there's any kind of resistance at the joint to stop that from happening. So, for example, here it's pinwheeling around that way, uh, down here it's pinwheeling that way, and here it's pinwheeling in the other direction, all in an attempt 
to allow the material near the outer edges, material that's not very well stabilized, to move out from under the load. This, by the way, is why you don't see very many cruciform columns because the outer material is not properly stabilized. You're much more likely to see uh, hollow tubes uh, where the outer walls help to stabilize each other. Hollow tubes also get more of the material further away from the center of the column and therefore uh, work more efficiently. Here are some other examples of this phenomenon. Now we can put some flanges that stiffen those edges. Turns out those flanges don't help very much though because they still buckle and still transfer the load back to the core and in the end the core is what determines what's going to work here and what doesn't. So if you want those flanges to work they have to be quite a bit wider than the ones we've done here. Um, because they still tend to give up too easily. Okay, here we have another form of local buckling. Here we have a column that's been slightly loaded and the walls are flat and smooth. But as we keep adding load, we get an inward dimple here, an outward bulging, an inward dimple, an outward bulging. And so all this material that's not near the corners where it's stabilized by some other material that's uh, some other sheet of material that braces it, uh, all that material tends to buckle and give up. So in the case of this column, we've got mutually braced material near each of these corners that's helping to hold it up. Again, you see the sort of pinwheel effect where the material that's dishing in here uh, occurs at the place where it's bulging out there. In other words, the rotation that's tending to occur at that corner is a sort of pinwheel cooperative effort where the materials are not fighting each other in terms of their behavior at the corners. Eventually we got the failure mode but to a large degree it was initiated by this local buckling because a substantial portion of this square tube is not really working very well in compression. All this stuff that's dished in and bulging out and dished in it's already given up and transferred its load somewhere else. This is the first of fourth bridge. It has uh, tubes that are about six feet in diameter. Um, the loads are fairly high but when your tubes get that big uh, even a quarter inch wall is adequate uh, to provide sufficient cross-sectional area. Uh, maybe even less than a quarter of an inch. But for a tube that large in diameter you can start to get local buckling. It's very rare in a round tube that you get local buckling, but if the wall gets thin enough you can actually get this kind of uh, failure phenomenon. And in the case of this bridge they dealt with it by riveting um, angles on the inside to provide local stiffening so that this dishing effect was less likely to occur. That ends our discussion of column modes of failure.